Okay, check, check. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Free Spiritual Community, where we do not do shame. As you see, our service will start in just over three minutes. We do go live on both Facebook and YouTube, so be sure to share that feed with friends and family so they can join us here this evening. Get yourself some wagon coffee, have a seat. We'll start here in just over two and a half minutes. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Free Spiritual Community. My name is Noelle, and I am the community director here at Free. Rev. Ryan is not with us tonight. He took the week off to celebrate Thanksgiving with his family. Free is a community of addicts and loved ones of addicts and spiritual refugees, and we are breaking the silence of addiction while creating space for healing, recovery, and spiritual connection. I just want to say hi to all of our online members, whether you're watching from a sober living house or a free circle or your elliptical, we are just really glad you are with us today. Now, there's a lot that we do here at Free, but there's one thing that we don't do. And last week, y'all crushed it. So from wherever Ryan is, if we could just be that loud so he could hear us, that would be great. It's four words and one thing that we don't do. Let's do it on the count of three. One, two, three. We don't do shame. I'm so proud of you all. All right. Well, a couple announcements here. Tonight is your first night here. Welcome. We are so glad you're here with us tonight. There are welcome bags right outside this door here. They have a little bit about what we do here at Free Spiritual Community, a little bit about what Wagon Coffee does. There's some swag items in there, a Free Spiritual Community bracelet. So please grab one on your way out, and uh, we're just really glad you're here with us this evening. So starting December 1st, it's a Thursday, so it'll be four consecutive Thursdays kicking off that day from 6.30 to 7.30. Rev Ryan and our home team, Laid Carey, will be leading this for us. It'll be an Advent kind of celebration. So a small group be in the cafe right next door 
four Thursdays, an hour each, just of a small group kind of getting together. And there's no real plan for it, and, and everyone is welcome. There will be an intentional kind of practice that's done every week. Um, but for the most part, it's just going to be a small group kind of getting together. So that kicks off this coming Thursday from 6.30 to 7.30 in the room next door. And next up, we have an ACA meeting kicking off here at Free. We've never had one before, so we're super excited about it. It starts on Thursday, but December 8th. So it'll be from noon to 1 p.m. in this, the big kids' room. Um, and an ACA, for those of you who are not familiar, is Adult Children of Alcoholic and Dysfunctional Families. So I'm not sure, is Carrie and Julie Holskin my mom? Yep. So if you have any questions, you can grab one of them after service. Um, but that kicks off December 8th and noon to 1 p.m. So we're super excited to have that meeting. All right, so we kick off our service every week with celebrations. Whether we're celebrating new babies or sobriety birthdays, we take three minutes here in service and then three minutes for our online community to type up what they're celebrating. Um, we'll have Austin pass around a microphone. And so just raise your hand and he'll come with the microphone and, and we'll just lift up whatever you're celebrating today. So let's take three minutes. I'm Tisha, I'm an alcoholic and yesterday I celebrated five months sober. <laughs> Congratulations, that's incredible. I'm Brian, addict alcoholic, and last week I celebrated three years. Congratulations, Brian. That's awesome. Hi, I'm Carrie. I'm an alcoholic, and my boyfriend welcomed a grandbaby uh, last week on Thanksgiving, and we're very happy to have him. That's awesome. Congratulations. My name is Kira, and I just want to celebrate Noelle and Mickey's engagement over Thanksgiving break. Aww. Thanks, Kira. What other celebrations? We've got about two minutes. There's one, Austin, by the camera. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm an alcoholic and addict. Um, I'm celebrating 31 days sober. Right on, Emily. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, this week, um, I am in a rehab. We are celebrating the life of somebody that we lost um, to an overdose. Um, his name was Jacob, and he was a really awesome part of our staff, so that's what we're focusing on this week. Mm, lifting him up and celebrating his life for sure. Thanks, Jessica. What other celebrations do we have in the house tonight? Hi, my name is Marlene. I'm celebrating 30 days. Congratulations. <laughs> oh my gosh, trouble over here. Hi, my name is Adam. I just wanted to uh, celebrate, thank, or give thanks to all the people that have survived heroin overdoses, fentanyl overdoses, and although I can't actually say it, I've got a new shirt, so. <laughs> it's a great I sweatshirt. It, I hope everybody has a good evening. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Scott. My name's Scott. Uh, so I want to celebrate Adam's birthday yesterday, to embarrass to say it. Yep. And on the 15th of this month, I celebrated seven years. <laughs> Lifting up Adam and you, Scott, for sure. 19 seconds left. Is there one last one we can get in? You guys gotta have some, come on. Those are a lot, those are great celebrations. Where is Abby at? Well, come on up here. Do you wanna do some celebrations with me? <laughs> Y'all give it up for Abby. She's part of our home team. Hi, Abby. Hi, hi. I'm so glad you're here with us. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Um, can I celebrate? 
something really quick? Is that yeah. okay? Um, I would like to celebrate you and oh. your husband, Chase. Thank you. So for those of you who don't know, we had Thanksgiving here at Free. We teamed up with Aurora Sober Living. So we had Thanksgiving here in the Free Cafe right next door from 6 to 9 on Thanksgiving um, evening, I guess it was. Yeah. Um, and you really led that for free and championed that for us. So you were able to not only participate and champion that for us, but also give people in our community an opportunity to go somewhere on Thanksgiving that wouldn't have had a place to go otherwise. So thank you for doing that. And we were just so appreciative of you. Oh, it, was, it was so, I mean, thank you guys for that opportunity. I mean, it was just an incredible experience. And we left just feeling so grateful to be part of a recovery community. I mean, it was an incredible, incredible experience. So well, thank we are you. forever grateful for you. So do you want to take the first one, Abby? Sure. Oh, wonderful. From oh. Ryan Canada. He must be new here. I mean, unknown user. <laughs> Celebrating time with friends and family this Thanksgiving, another sober Thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for my sobriety. And so, so grateful for this community. And congrats, Mickey and Noel, on that engagement. Aw, thanks, Ryan. Aww. Much deserved time off. Sarah says, I started a culinary apprenticeship focused on recovery, 16 months sober on Monday, and five years off Matt. Ooh. That's incredible. A culinary apprenticeship focused awesome. on recovery. That's really cool. Steven Sellup, the family is together, and my younger daughter has secured a new position in Washington, D.C. Oh, that's great. Steven, we're, awesome. we're lifting your daughter up. And Steven's in Pennsylvania. He joins us every week from that's the so East cool. Coast. That's so cool. Hi, Steven. Stephanie, celebrating my 1,792nd sober gift with my uncle. We cut trees in my yard and enjoyed time together. It was 52 degrees and sunny. Oh my gosh, we love Stephanie and we're lifting that up for sure. Stephanie joins us from Michigan each week. Jim Pilcher, celebrating a sublime Thanksgiving gathering that brought us together closer than anyone expected at the end of this devastating year. Haraka Hatova. Man, you must have really been listening to Ryan I last pay, week. I pay attention. Holy moly. It was Who fun else to can say. say that? <laughs> No one. You were the only one listening. So that's great. And Abby, that red dot means that we have no more celebrations. Well, thank you. You're so welcome. Yeah. Thank you for joining me up here, Abby. Um, oh, there's one more. Jen, celebrating living my life open about my journey through the stages of my recovery. Three years, two months, and 18 days sober. That's incredible. <laughs> Giving it up for Jen, too. Gosh, her and her wife join us each week from North Carolina. So a lot of... Um, a lot of people from out of state tonight. That's always great. Well, we are in our third week of our series, Recovery and Gratitude, and we have a video for y'all to check out. Gratitude allows an individual to celebrate the present and be an active participant in life. Practicing gratitude not only affects the thoughts and behaviors of those battling addiction, but it also has profound implications on the way we interact with the world around us. My freshman year in college, I was placed in a dorm room with Kelly Regenball, just by the luck of the draw. And Kelly and I, we quickly became best friends. Kelly played volleyball and I played basketball. And we hung out in the same friend group. We went to all the same parties together and, and attended the same study sessions together. Now one day, Kelly and I decided that we were gonna go up to Powderhorn Mountain, which was the local ski resort in the area. And this normally wouldn't have been a big deal except for we were contractually obligated not to go. You see, if you were if you were playing a sport for the university, you had to sign a contract saying that you would avoid putting yourself at risk by skiing and a long list of other things that we didn't really read. This was, avoid, get, this was to avoid getting hurt and you know, comp compromising our position as student athletes. Now, as an alcoholic, if I have to sign a contract to not go ski on a mountain during basketball season, what do y'all think I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go ski, and that's what we did. And halfway through the day, Kelly is going down a mountain and she hits a tree. And her body goes one way and her leg goes another. And we go home that day and Kelly's in a cast and she has a hairline fracture on her right leg. Whoops. Now it gets better. A few weeks later, we were at a house party off campus on a Friday night. 
And it suddenly becomes very apparent that the police are going to be busting this house party. We heard them come up front. And so as intoxicated and underage college kids, we're going to run from this house party. And so we leave from the back door, go over the fence, but there's just one problem. Kelly still has her boot on from the ski accident week before. And it turns out it's really hard to jump a fence and run from the police if you have a cast on your right foot. And so Kelly lands on her left foot on the other side of this fence, and she breaks her left foot coming down. Whoops. So Kelly gets crutches, and she has casts on both of her feet, and she's affectionately called ski boots by everyone across campus. And people, you know, they start opening doors for her. And she has a pass to be five minutes late to class. And no professor could do anything about it. Everyone is helping Kelly. They see her in her cast and in her crutches. Then all of a sudden, about six weeks later, what happens? Healing happened. The cast and the crutches were gone, and, and then it was just Kelly. We all know that feeling, and we love that feeling of losing the cast. We all want to be healed, but if we're honest, we love those crutches. Kelly Regimball earned those crutches, and they can be really difficult to give up. You know, we're in work, week three of our series tonight on gratitude and recovery. And the starting point for this evening is, how do we live into gratitude? Like, how do we lay down the crutches that prevent us from living into gratitude? I want to encourage you this evening, but I also want to challenge you. Because I think we need both those things, to be encouraged and to be challenged. And so if I challenge you this evening and, and you start to feel uncomfortable and triggered, I want you to sit with what part of you that's triggering. Because sometimes the same truth that offends the flesh is the same truth that awakens your heart. So tonight my message is titled, Enough with the Crutch. So let's take Kelly Regimbal's crutch framework and journey back to John chapter 5 with me. Verse 1 through 9. Verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate Pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Now, really quick, if you miss the tone here, you miss the heart of God. Because the first time that I read that, I was like, are you serious? Like, do you want to get well? I mean, of course, he wants to get well. And if you hear it that way, you're missing his empathy and his, his compassion. When you hear, do you want to get well, I want you to hear it with a smile on his face and, and with joy in his heart. Do you want to get well? Verse 7 Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and he walked. This man had been stuck in a pool in Bethesda for almost four decades 38 years, and suddenly Jesus comes walking up nonchalantly on the scene and asks him, do you want to get well? And this guy is probably thinking, and rightfully so, are you kidding me? Like, of course, of course I want to get well. It's the, it's the obvious resounding answer there. But let's pause there for a second. Because Jesus didn't ask, do you want your situation to change? Do you want your circumstances to change? Because we all want breakthrough in our situations. We want breakthrough in our finances, and in our job, in our addiction, and in our loved one's addiction. But Jesus didn't ask, do you want to change your finances, or your job, or your addiction? Jesus just asked, do you want to change? 
And before you give the obvious answer, what if I told you that you have to be grateful for the pain that you're drowning in? There has to be this internal shift in your perspective. Like that has to occur first. Free spiritual community, do you want to get well? You know, there's a couple crutches that I have a feeling you hold on to. I have a feeling you hold on to them because I hold on to them too. And my two favorite ones are the blame crutch and the identity crutch. And I love having something to blame, especially when I was in active addiction. Like if you had the job that I had, you would drink like I do. And if you had the legal problems that I have, you would use the way that I do. Well, do you want to heal, Noelle? Well, well, yeah. But it was a really good excuse when I was having a bad day. Guys, it's not me. It's just it's the alcohol. It's, it's not me. It's the jail time that I'm facing. I began to romance, you know, this disguise and the crutches that I had created for myself. If I'm being honest, I loved that disguise and I loved that facade because I could hide behind it. Guys, it's not me. It's the church that wronged me. Yeah, it was. Guys, it's not me. It's my family member and, and their struggle with addiction. Yeah, it, it is. Guys, it's not me. My parents, they just they can't put down the drugs. My spouse, they, they won't stop pushing me. My kids, they won't go get help. It's not me. It's them. And you're so right about that. And I just, I just want to validate that for you tonight. Like, I don't have a game here. You're, you're right. It's not you. It's them. It's not you. It's the thing. And it's for that reason, you guys, that it's so hard to get well sometimes. Because our excuses not to are almost too good. I love my blame crutch. And I love hiding behind it because it's like my get out of jail free card. Because here's the thing, now that I'm sober, if I have a bad day or if I hurt someone or if I fail at my goals, I have nobody and no thing to blame that on except me. But here's the catch about crutches. We are always leasing those crutches. For as long as you have them in your life, you will never own it. And we only ever pay for those crutches. And eventually we start to pay for them in our relationships because blame makes intimacy and compassion impossible. What started as a crutch to help us heal is now this weapon to keep other people away. We have to learn to lay down these crutches that we hide behind. You know, we have to. And the way that we combat these crutches that keeps us from getting well is gratitude. You know, having gratitude even in the most heart-wrenching of situations. It's not excusing. And having gratitude, it's not trusting again. It's just living in gratitude is about releasing. For your spiritual community, do you want to get well? You know, these crutches, they're so familiar. And we love familiar. Kelly Regenbaugh got comfortable with a special treatment that she got from her crutches. 38 years, that man in Bethesda sat by the pool, assuming the identity that he would be a sick man forever. Hell, last week I sat where Kira was sitting while Rev Ryan was getting ready for service, and he had the, the hands-free microphone around him, and he let me know that next week I would have to preach with the hands-free microphone. And I had never done that before. And the first words out of my mouth were, well, I can't preach with the hands-free microphone. I've never done it before. That's my crutch. The joke's on him, because I wore a dress tonight, and you can't clip the, the hands-free thing, so now I get to... But that's besides the point. He won the battle, but I won the war. There's these, no, these crutches are, are this known territory, which is why a lot of times addiction can be less scary than sobriety, because that's slavery, but at least that's a slavery that we're familiar with. Like, at least I know what that hell is like. This might be why you're stuck in your faith journey or why you're stuck in your sobriety journey. Because these crutches that you've held on to, God's let you get this far holding on to them. And now you're stuck because you know that there's more. And you're hungry. And you're trying to take these crutches with you. And God is saying, hey, where we're going, you can't take these with you. The first step to laying down these crutches and these stories that we tell ourselves 
is through gratitude. You know, gratitude is what makes sense of our past, and it brings peace for today, and it has this funny way of giving us a vision for the future and for tomorrow. So when we ask ourselves, how the heck do I release something like this from my life? That's a great question. You know, the picture, it's pretty, but the process is really painful, yet the product is peace. But it's so much easier said than done, and I get that. Like, how do I do this? How do I forgive that? And we all have a that, and you know what yours is. You know, one of my favorite lines in the back of the big book, it really breaks this down for me. And it says, I can do the same thing with an AA meeting. The more I focus my mind on its defects, the late start, the long drunk logs, cigarette smoke, the worse the meeting becomes. But when I try to see what I can add to the meeting rather than what I can get out of it, when I focus my mind on what is good about it rather than what's wrong with it, the meeting keeps getting better and better. And here's, here's the gold. When I focus on what's good today, I have a good day. When I focus on what's bad, I have a bad day. If I focus on the problem, the problem increases. If I focus on the answer, the answer increases. You know, gratitude, it starts really small, you guys. It starts with a shift in perspective in an AA meeting. It starts with a, a daily practice. It starts with letting your loved one know that you appreciate them. Because if I focus on the good today, I have a good day. You know, one of the most selfish things I do when I start working with women in early recovery is I have them text me every morning one thing that they are grateful for. And in turn, I respond with one thing that I am grateful for. And it's a selfish ask because it immediately gets me in the mindset to focus on the good for that day. From experience, gratitude it ignites this fire in me because I'm forced to drop these man-made crutches and these stories that I cling to. And then, and then I'm forced to be patient and wait for God to come through. And when he does my faith, it starts to build. And then I lean on that crutch, the gratitude crutch. And then almost accidentally, I'm, I'm leaning on God. I've heard it say that gratitude is the act of wholeness. You know, somebody hurt you and somebody wronged you. And because of that, a piece of your heart, it's now missing. And the way to get that back is through gratitude. Your wholeness as a human being is directly correlated to your ability to see the silver lining in the worst of circumstances. And I'm not pretending that that's easy because I know that it's not. I've watched my mom, a fourth generation loved one of an addict, this is a woman who her entire life has been ravaged by drugs and alcohol, and she wasn't the one doing them. I've watched her very difficult journey to gratitude through all the counseling and the groups up until the moment where she finally opened her clenched heart and she released her parents and she released her siblings and she even released me. And she said, you know, they're just doing the best that they can just like me. And she released that hold that her family's addiction and the dysfunctional stories had over her. And she's been able to see the good and even the worst of circumstances. You know, there are people out here, out there tonight, and people in here tonight, and they're struggling, and they're looking to those of us who have walked this path before them. And they aren't just looking for answers, but they're really wondering if there's such thing as real peace and real joy. And when they look at us, when they look at you, and when they look at me, what, what are they gonna see in us? Will they see blame, or the identity, or, or the addiction excuse? Will they see the dysfunctional stories that we tell, that we hide behind as human beings? Or will they see a group of people who have done the hard work, who live as if gratitude is action? A group of people who lean into their faith, instead of man-made crutches, a group of people who are well. You know, I pray that the people who are struggling see addicts and loved ones of addicts and spiritual refugees in this building who are alive, and not just alive, but who have confidence even through the highs and the lows, who live in gratitude even through the thick and the thin. People who say, I'll walk this journey with you. 
to the other side because I believe that every valley has one thing in common, that they all end. But you don't get to the end without gratitude. Your family needs you well. This community needs you well. And this world needs you well. And I want to play a song for you. And as I do so, I want to do something really selfish here. I want you all to reflect on one thing that you're really grateful for, really grateful for. And in turn, I'm going to do the same. For those of you who are new with us this evening, the next portion of our service is a storyteller portion. So whatever series we're in this week, it being gratitude, we always choose a person that, that really lines up with that series. And so I can't think of a better person to join me up here in a gratitude series than Mickey. So if Mickey could join me up here, that would be wonderful. 
Y'all give it up for Mickey. There you are. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> oh my goodness. It, isn't that working? There, you there go. I am. On. There, there you are. Well, it's good to have you up here. Good to be up here. So Mickey, you have been sober for three and a half years now. Lead me up to the fall of 2018, right before you got sober, the months before, and what that looked like for you. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting time of my life. Um, it was, it, it was interesting because I, I had been struggling with alcohol for quite a while and, uh, the walls were starting to really come in at that point. Um, uh, I knew in my heart that I needed uh, change, but I didn't. <clears throat> I didn't want to get well. I just wanted my circumstances to change, just like you were saying. And um, you know, friends and family were starting to really lay on the heat, or so I felt that you know, hey, dude, you really need to cut this out. And um, <clears throat> with that, um. Uh, my depression really started to plummet because I really started to, on a daily basis, just live in failure. Uh, I, I, I chose to quit drinking thousands of times. Every, every morning I would say I'd, I'd stop, and then by lunch I'd be, you know, figuring out which, which liquor store I'd be going to. And so uh, a couple things happened in the fall of 18. Um, I, I, I did end up going to uh, a couple meetings. Uh, I hated them. Mm -hmm. We all um, did in the beginning. I hated looking up at the board and I said, nope, not for me. And I'd go home and uh, drink some whiskey and try to figure uh, an alternative <laughs> method. And... Um, um, but like I said, my depression was really getting to me, and, and, and at that time, it, w it, was, it was sometime in the fall, uh, but uh, my brain had convinced myself that I was an utter failure, and my kids were better off in this world without me. Mm -hmm. And um, on my way home from work, I would travel this overpass um, in Buda, Texas, and, and uh, I was eyeing this overpass for weeks, and I said, yep, that's, that's tall enough. There's enough asphalt to the side. I won't hurt anyone else. But if I were to jump, that would be the place. And um, um, one night, the walls just got too close, and, and I grabbed a bottle of whiskey and uh, hopped in my truck and uh, was going to go. And uh, my ex at the time called my dad. My dad called me right away, um, called me once, I declined it, um, called me right back, ended up talking to him, um, long story short, um, nothing happened, um, I ended up uh, going home that night, but that was scary because I wasn't 100% sure that I was going to jump, but I also wasn't 100% sure that I was not, and um, so that was really scary, and then... Um, uh, a couple months later, uh, I was dealing with some health issues, this stomach issue that was only a secret. Uh, I, I was the only one that knew it, and, 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 and I felt it the first night uh, that my son was born in 16. So for two years, I held on to this secret, and, um, and I had to, uh, and, and so that was weighing on me a ton. Um, and I had to get to a point where I actually sent a text message to my mom, who's sitting right there. Um, Hi, Nancy. And, um, and the text said something like, I think I'm sick. I need you to go to the doctor with me. Because I didn't have the courage to go to the doctor. Um, the Googles 
told me everything <laughs> like that I'm dying. Yep. And, and, um, it's the worst thing you can so, do is WebMD your symptoms. Yeah. yeah. So I call, uh, um, my mom, uh, it was the greatest thing, um, responded right away, um, make the appointment, I'm on the first flight. Oh, God, and, nice. um, and so she came down and we went to the doctor and we were driving to the doctor and uh, we were talking, I, I don't really remember, but I do remember that she said, you have to be honest with the doctor. Now, I'm an alcoholic. I don't like being honest. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of our problems. I like to say anything to get by. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so we, we, we go to the doctor. Um, he tells me I'm not dying, but I am a walking heart attack. And um, a couple days later, they call me with the lab results. Mm -hmm. And the lab results, <laughs> the, the lady goes, hey, so everything's good except your liver. Uh, it's off the charts, mm. and uh, uh, you have to retest. Don't don't drink drink for a week, and then you have to come back in. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know how to not drink tonight. <laughs> and um, so three three days go by. This is right before Christmas. My dad and stepmom fly in. Uh, they're with us over Christmas. Rough Christmas Eve. I end up taking a uh, a. Uh, a shot of whiskey that I had in my golf bag. And um, uh, the, the night went on, uh, everyone went to bed, and I had two pints of whiskey uh, in, in my golf bag. And I'm up trying to assemble a bike, and I proceed to kill both pints of whiskey in a very short amount of time, pass out on the couch, only to be woken up by my dad Christmas morning. Um, slapping my face and when I came to it um, there were my two kids opening presents and they were already through their stockings and I was just horrified and um, so that was awful so that with the doctor spurred a three-month span of not drinking and it was awful um, I was just white knuckling it it was brutal and um, and uh, at the end of that, I said, well, this isn't any better than drinking. So I celebrated my willpower and uh, with a bottle of whiskey and, and uh, sent me on a nice month-long relapse. Yeah. And, uh, so what do you think the crutches or the stories that you were telling yourself were that were keeping you from getting well? Well, the alcohol was my biggest crutch. Um, it... I, one of my main character defects is fear of failure. And as long as I had something to blame, uh, I, I was free and clear. So if I failed at something, well, it's just the booze. If I didn't succeed at this, it was just the booze. Um, I didn't have to really kind of uh, take, um, I wouldn't say responsibility, but it was, it, it was just there. It was like my get out of jail free card. Yeah, yeah. So what was the perspective shift? So what changed from you white knuckling it? You have this month long relapse. And then what was the perspective shift that you had to finally get recovery? Well, uh, after that um, uh, relapse, I, I, I went back into an AA meeting and uh, finally looked up at the board and that first step even though the words didn't change, it, they read differently to me. And, um, and I finally realized that I am powerless over alcohol. And it's not my battle. It's not my war to fight. And it's not my demon to slay. It has to be greater than me. And, um, and so that was huge. Um, and another thing happened. My, my sponsor, you know, kind of a few months into it, um, I was really struggling with doing the fourth step. Mm. And he was very patient with me, but he really realized I needed to be kicked in the butt. Um, for my, for we my, all do. <laughs> yeah. And so he said, well, it's apparent you didn't do step three correct. And, um, and I was kind of pissed at that because I was like, man, I thought we were going this way. Now we're going this way. And, um, 
um, that night I had this great walk, and uh, I was I was um, kind of praying, and I and and God laid this vision on me um, where I was the Psalms 23 was in my head, and I was in this kind of valley, and there were these mountains all surrounding me, and like dudes with pitchforks, and like my enemies, and at this table on the other side, there was Jesus just sitting there, and and he wasn't doing anything like, hey, let's get out of here, what, you know, um, um, you know, do this or do that, he was just peacefully sitting there, and um, what I realized in that moment is he was so calm because he had conquered all of that, Mm. and um, it was, it's, it's like when my son gets scared at, you know, in the dark, um, I'll just sit there with him, and I know n- there's nothing to be afraid of. And so I realized that out there, um, those aren't my battles. Those, those aren't my things to conquer because God's already conquered those for oh. me. And so that's when that step three really clicked, and I was able to give it over to him. Which step three is turning your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand him. And so that's when that clicked for you, turning your, your will, your problems, taking that off of your shoulders and just, this is not mine to fight. Like you've already got this and, and the weight that came off your shoulders. Yeah, because up until then I thought this, this you know, my world was my world and, 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 and the circumstances and people and everything was my battle. Um, and, and when that changed, there was so much freedom that, uh, or, or, or so much weight that came off of my shoulders. And, and I was actually able to experience freedom because I didn't have to fear. Yeah. Um, I knew one way or the other, it's going to work out whether I agree with it or not. God's way bigger than I am. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and, and, and he's a, he has a better script than I do. Mm-hmm. You have this piece of paper. I think, do we have a photo of it? You have this piece of paper on your, your side of the mirror in the bathroom. Will you tell me what it says and why you have that? It's a very simple letter, but it means so much to me. Um, this guy that, um, back in Austin, um, when, when he spoke, I listened. Um, he was just... Every time he spoke, I felt like he was just speaking to me. But he always talked, and I, I didn't create this. I stole that from him and just put my name in there. Um, but um, this is a very simple letter to get my mind right that I just, you know, I, I, he, he is so in charge. And when I find myself self stepping in and, um, you know, trying to help out, um, I get myself in trouble, so this is a great reminder to me that um, <laughs> he doesn't need my help today, yeah. and just get out of the way. And for those of you who can't, can't see or read, it says, Mickey, thank you, but I will not be needing your help today. Sincerely, God. And so I just, um, I see that too, and I just love that. So how, tell me how recovery or gratitude plays a part in your recovery today. Well, it's huge. Um, you know, I, I used to um, always focus on the negative. I used to always focus on, um, um, you know, what I didn't accomplish, a failure here, a failure there. And it, and, it, and it literally, I mean, just had my depression off the charts. Yeah. And the great thing about the recovery community is people talk about gratitude. And I was like, what the hell do you have to be uh, what is this? Little by little, when I started practicing it, and you start focusing on the good things instead of the bad, something weird happens where your mood changes. Everything seems brighter outside. The flowers smell really good. Um, the things that used to be so rough and uh, terrible in, in my life really didn't have that that huge of an effect because yeah. I was focusing on the, the, the good things. Mm-hmm. And it's, 
it's all here. Yep, it's a perspective shift, and, an internal perspective shift. And that picture from last week that was up from the storyteller, where yep. the, with the bus and the and the mountain or the beautiful view, it's so true. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's all about perspective, and if and if we can change a perspective, there's always two ways to look at something. Always, yep. So, what would you tell the person who is still struggling? You know, the person who is about to get in their truck with a pint of whiskey, who's looking for that overpass because they don't think that there's another way out. What would you tell them today? I would say um, no matter what your thoughts of, of God are, big or small, here or non-existent, um, he's a lot bigger than we could ever imagine. And he's always working whether we agree or 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 think he is um, um, what I've realized is is um, even though I spent many years trying to get well I didn't want to but he was preparing me over a course of many years for a very magical moment and I needed every single heartache and every single moment and every single time I cried out, why aren't you here? He had me in the most magical spot that, that I had to be in. And it's almost like <clears throat> if, you're, if you're right up against a, a, a painting and someone's painting it and you're looking at the brush strokes and you're going, that doesn't make sense. Nope, that's wrong. What are you doing? And then when they pull you back, you see this beautiful mural, and you're like, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, no matter if you're in the worst of times or the best of times, just be confident and have faith that God is working because it's a beautiful thing when you can look back and you go, yes, that time stunk, but I needed that for this time. Yep, absolutely. And... And the, the beautiful thing about this is my sobriety <clears throat> isn't for myself. Um, my sobriety is, is God's preparation, and, and, and now he has turned me into a vessel, and you into a vessel, and everyone else here into a vessel to be his boots on the ground here to do his work. And, 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 and when we realize that, and we become... And we understand that, that really gets us going. And, and that, that sign or that, that little note, you know, it is very easy for us to go, yep, I'm out of the way. You just, you just do your work and, 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 and you let me know how I can, you know, uh, help. Yep, we're just conduits to God yep. for another. Well, before I let you go, Mickey, I do want to say we are going to be having a Christmas Eve service here. Um, I hope you all can join us. It'll be at 7 p.m., and it'll be a very special service. Uh, but one of the reasons why it's going to be so special is because Mickey will be playing Silent Night for us. So I hope you all can be there this Christmas Eve and, and join us that night. But thank you so much for joining me up here. You're welcome. Love you. Y'all give it up for Mickey. All right, so similar to celebrations, the next part of our service is heartaches. We don't want to skip over the hard stuff. We want to pray with you and walk through it with you. So similar to celebrations, Austin's going to walk around with a microphone. If you could just raise your hand, he'll come over and, and we'll, we'll pray for you and we'll walk with you through this journey. So let's take three minutes for heartaches. There's gotta be something we can lift up for someone. There's one, there's a couple. Hi, 
I um, I'm just feeling a little sad. My son took the overpass four years ago in 2018, and I miss him. What was your son's name? Mitchell. Mitchell. You'll be praying for Mitchell and lifting that one up. Thank you for sharing that with us. We're here for you. Um, earlier, I shared uh, for a celebration for somebody that we lost um, in Pathfinders this week, but I think that um, maybe just all, everybody that's in Pathfinders right now needs praying for all of the staff, all of the um, all the residents in there um, due to our loss of our friend Jacob. Mm. Lifting Jacob up, praying for him and his family. Mm. Um, I would just like for my brother James, who's in his early stages of kidney failure, um, just lift up your hearts for him and give him strength to get through this early stages and hope God can heal him. Absolutely. We're lifting James up for sure. Thank you for sharing. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm a lot louder than I thought. Uh, I really just want to pray for the people in the Springs. I'm from Colorado Springs, and I actually have a friend who's in the hospital right now that was shot at Club Q. She was the DJ that night. So if you guys can lift up all the people that were injured, that would be awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, lifting up everyone in the community of Club Q. And for those of you who didn't see it in the cafe here, um, we have a station to write letters, and we will be sending it from our community to theirs. And, and there's a ton of letters in there already, but if you feel compelled to do so after service, please go to that station in the cafe and write, uh, write letters to the community, lifting them up, letting them know that we're here for them. Got 30 seconds left. Uh, <clears throat> Asking for prayers for not only my son, but others that struggle with schizophrenia. Mm. What is your son's name? Alex. Alex. Lifting him up. Thank you. Praying for him for sure. I just want to ask for continued prayers. For my friend David, who lost his daughter last week, he's struggling. Yeah, we're lifting up the Murphy family for sure. Is it on? Yeah. Yep. Well, welcome, Austin. For those of you who haven't met Austin, he's on our home team. Yeah. All, all those blue doing? shirts, that's, that, that's what they mean. So feel free to ask him any questions. Concerns can definitely go to him. So I know where the bathrooms are. So. <laughs> Helpful. Do you want to take the first one, Austin? Yeah. Uh, this one's from Doug Petty. He says, uh, still praying for the guy from last week whose daughter took her life. Yep. Thank There's you for years. lifting that up, Doug. That was the family, the Murphy family. So if we could keep Desiree and the Murphy family in our prayers, that would be great. Thank you for that, Doug. Sarah, my cousin was buried today from a fentanyl overdose. My sis passed away in August from liver failure. Prayers for all my family and each one of you. Thank you for that, Sarah. We're lifting up your cousin and your family and your sister. This one's from Terry Cahoon. She says, pray for financial issues. Mm. Lifting that up for sure, Terry. We're praying for you. Christy, prayers for my mother and her son that I met yesterday who are struggling. They need a safe home and working a vehicle to in order to hold a job. They are struggling to stay afloat. Prayers for your mother and your son, Christy. We love you all and we're grateful you're a part of this community. This one's from Stephen. Uh, please pray for Philip S. He has been diagnosed with malignant melanoma mm. and is, an experimental tr is in an experimental trial in Pittsburgh. We're definitely lifting up Philip. Mm, absolutely, Stephen. Thank you for sharing. Lifting him up for sure. Chris, prayers for the teen who drowned in Roxboro this week? Okay, great. Lifting him up. Thank you for sharing, Chris. This one's from Terry again. Uh, Club Q, blessings to the survivors and the families of those killed. Yeah, lifting that Thanks, up. We, we lifted that up um, you know, here in, in the church. So we appreciate that, Terry. Thank you for that. And that red button means that, that we're done. You did great, Austin. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Well, you guys, 
there are three ways that you can donate to the mission at Free Here to further our agenda of breaking the silence of addiction. And the first one is to download the free, free app. And there's a giving tab under that app. The second is to go to www.freespiritualcommunity.com slash give. And the third is to text be the wagon to the number that's on your screen. And we know that it's your generous donations that keep our mission and lights on in this place going. So we thank you for that. Well, I think it's time to go out with a prayer. Would you, Kara, do you want to join me? I would love that. That's right. If you all know Kira, you know she's having an anxiety attack right now. So thank you for that. Well, Let's go out with a third step prayer. But before we do so, let's take a moment of silence for the Murphy family, Club Q, and anyone else who's struggling. And then whenever you're ready, if you could lead us in the third step prayer, I would love that. Sure. God. God. I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I would help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out. We hope you have a great night and, and be well and, and drop those crutches. <laughs>